Good afternoon, everyone. We are here to discuss a very interesting topic today, uh, accelerating your e-commerce uh, experience digitally. We have a fantastic panel today representing different parts of this exciting and rapidly changing sector. We have with us today, Yash Gangwal, founder Urban Monkey uh, in India, Jasmine Gohil, Chief Technology Officer of Sugar Cosmetics, Pankaj Kankar, CTPO, AGO, Fashion and Lifestyle, Reliance Retail, Ishendra Agawal, founder at Jiva, and Charlie Russell, Senior Product Marketing Manager, Layer Zero by Limelight. Welcome everyone, I'm glad to have you on the, uh, on the panel today. My name is Ravi Swaroop. I'm a partner with the consulting firm Bain & Company, and I will be moderating today's discussion. The rapid development of e-commerce in India is not news to us, uh, as I'm sure you know, the panelists and uh, the listeners would concur. We at Bain & Company have been partnering with our insurgent clients in shaping the sector, as well as supporting our clients who are participating in the sector to help develop winning strategies. In our recent report called How India Shops Online, the enormity of where e-commerce has already reached in India was actually uh, displayed. We have 140 million shoppers last year, which is the third highest number of e-retail shoppers in the world, uh, behind only China and the US. E-retail market at 40 billion US today is growing at 25% year on year, and that's likely to continue for the foreseeable future, at least the next five to seven years. With this rapid rate of growth, modern trade, which has been in the country for more than 25 years, will be smaller than the e-commerce sector in four years from now. That's the scale of growth we're talking about. E-commerce is ubiquitous. We have about 98% of India's pin codes that actually ordered an apparel, a piece of apparel last year, and 97% of pin codes actually ordered a uh, mobile phone. That's really how widespread the e-commerce phenomena is in the country. With that having established, it's clear that winning in e-commerce is not just important, but almost existential. Uh, it's a fierce battleground, both for native countries as well as digital first companies. User experience is an absolutely critical component of winning in e-commerce. And that's really the topic of discussion today. With that brief background, I will start with the first question. And perhaps Ishendra, I'll point this to you, but would love for all the panelists to pitch in with their views. So while there is uh, Ishendra, a direct linkage between user experience and outcomes on e-commerce uh, e or transactions, there are perhaps larger implications of user experience. Could you share your views on how user experience actually impacts the brand image and uh, perceptions that users may have about the brand itself? Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ravi, uh, you know, for uh, starting the discussion on user experience and the importance of it in e-commerce industry. So actually user experience is a very important key to build a large brand in e-commerce because if there is not delight in user experience, no user will come back to you again and will make a purchase again, right? Because, you know, with the increase in cost of marketing, cost of acquiring new user keeps on increasing you know, as you scale. So, and if there is no repeat, then you essentially lose out on a free user. And you also lose out on a customer evangelist who will talk about your brand to multiple other folks. And this in turn leads to your higher marketing costs, which fits very bad in unit economics and hence the brand tax, which is why having a right user experience is much, much important. It's very important in the entire journey of building a large brand. And that user experience, it just, you know, is not limited to a tech user experience or any specific user experience, but it starts with the right set of product, with the perfect quality of product, then having the entire seamless tech stack to service the customer, then ensuring your delivery services are seamless and trackable, and then your post-purchase customer support experience is also seamless. So it is just not limited to pre-purchase, but also the post-purchase experience that a user gets. Well, he makes a bunch of great points. Um, and, you know, one of the things that research shows is that when people leave, they often don't come back. And one of the things that makes them leave is a poor user experience. So uh, I might start there. Anyone else got thoughts? I think, you know, Ishin rightly pointed out 
it is not only tech experience or uh, purchase experience that a lot of time we sort of focus on. But I think the first thing is the product itself and the product yeah. quality. And then a lot of post-purchase experience, you know, which plays a very significant role in, in you know, the delight of the customer and they coming back. Uh, so I think this has to be looked holisti holistically as Ishan has mentioned. So that's sort of what I would like to mention. Yeah, I think that resonates very strongly, uh, as Ishindra was talking about it. I mean, of course, all our businesses start with having the right product as such, but how we deliver that uh, product and the experience of discovering, purchasing, and you know, uh, uh, receiving and experiencing the usage of that product. So it's the entire user, uh, user, user journey from discovery to usage and uh, is really where you know, as uh, as providers of products and services, uh, you know, we have to think about the experience on all of these touch points. And that's really, I think, uh, where you were going, Ishendra, with that it's not just the tech, but the entire experience. And a lot of it would be delivered perhaps through technology, but a lot of it through the processes. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I guess our organization sitting behind the technology. But we'd love to hear uh, right. opinions from others uh, as well. You know, uh, at uh, Urban Monkey, we, we kind of look at the whole uh, user experience and kind of flip it around. So, you know, if we were a retail store a, 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 on the streets and we had a thousand customers coming in and 900 would have shoved stuff in their cart and left it at the payment counter, we would have like lost our minds as to, you know, why are there so many shopping carts at our counter? So, you know, we look at it at a very fundamental level as well that, Without having that experience, you're already uh, uh, giving the customer reasons to not trust you, which is why they're probably abandoning their cart and leaving. So it's 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 like the most most important or fundamental thing of being a D2C or an e-commerce brand has to be the website experience and the ease of use. Since there's so many regional languages, people not everybody knows add to guard or whatever but they know the icons and the shopping bags. It's, it's very, very important in a place like India, I feel. That's a great point, yes. Essentially, you know, uh, whether it's digital or in-person, right? As as close uh, as you can get to an in-person experience, a live experience, you don't, you don't wait for pages to load. You don't wait yep. for people to reappear when you're actually visiting a, pay, uh, exactly. a store. Uh, and you're not uh, talking to animated objects. So how yep. close can you come to a real experience on the digital world. That's yep. a very interesting and refreshing thought. Yep. So, great. So perhaps, uh, Yash, Jasmine, I'll yep. ask the next question to you. Uh, okay. You know, we spoke about the user experience and how that's important uh, and how you think about uh, all the touch points. All of your businesses are deeply reliant, either fully or significantly on e-commerce. How do you think about the key metrics, which in absolute terms or uh, from a trend perspective, help you mm -hmm. track and define success? Yeah, I think, so, yeah, I'll let Justine yeah. go first. Yeah, so there is a great line, say, which says like, you can't improve what you don't measure, right? So it is very important to measure. Uh, and there are key metrics uh, which you can measure and the most important in e-commerce business is a conversion rate, right? I mean, everything boils down to conversion rate. Uh, so conversion rate is nothing but uh, so how many percentage of the users are making a purchase uh, after visiting your website. So that is a conversion rate. So this is the most important thing, and there are many things, right? So if, if so, this is the bottom of the funnel. So if you go to the top of the funnel, so it is also important to drive more traffic to your website and app, right? And to drive the more traffic, again there are like multiple things one is obviously a paid marketing uh, which is not beneficial in a long run uh, because it, it it hits your pnl right and there comes the seo and the organic traffic right so seo is uh, in in the app era also it is very very important and which can drive uh, significant organic traffic to your website uh, the other metrics that is important is also a customer lifetime value so, or a period of time, like how much money that you're making from a customer. 
uh, again, there are multiple things. One, because this lifetime value depends on like two things. Uh, one is obviously how much uh, average order value you can drive uh, from one customer. And the other thing is the repeat of the customer, right? So how many times the same uh, customer making purchase from your website. So here, again, this depends on the user experience, right? Because if user is happy with the with your website, with the post purchase experience, then they'll come again and they'll buy. And, and the average order value, so you can work on average order value with the multiple things, right? So there is uh, upsell, so you can on the cart page or various pages, you can upsell your products you can create the combos and kits uh, and sell multiple products in one go. So, so there are various ways to uh, improve the average order value. Uh, then the most important thing is customer acquisition cost, right? So how much you're spending on acquiring the customer. Uh, so that is also most important part. Uh, the card drop off, which Yash already mentioned, uh, so that is also a very important matrix. How many people are dropping after heading to the cart, and how you can bring them back? And then there are uh, various metrics. So yes, you can probably. Yeah. No, I think I think uh, you know, Jasmine, you rightly said the most important one is your conversion rate, and everything else uh, below that kind of all the other metrics are what you tweak to make your conversion rate much better than it is. So I think it's very important for uh, new businesses and business in general to split up the metrics separately for ads. Like you said, for ads, it's about customer acquisition costs, the ROAS, the click-through rate to see how good your creative is. Are people actually buying in, clicking on that ad and moving to the next part? And then you look at your website mat metrics, like you said, the abandonment rate for cart for checkout abandonment rate as well there is a uh, a lot of that going on in india and you know ultimately all these things do define your conversion rate uh, but i think one thing that is also important which uh, we need to track as an e-commerce business is your uh, metrics for your product what is your sell through rate what is your turnaround time you know without those fundamentals uh, you know it does get hard to even maintain good metrics if you don't have enough products xyz so that's that's the one bit that i'd like to add one metric that i would bring up uh, as a good leading indicator you know a leading indicator that uh, you know gets in front of a lot of the other ones is google core web vitals yeah and uh, what google core web yeah. vitals does um, you know for those of you who don't know um, it's a new uh, metric set of metrics by google that measures how fast the page loads how quickly it becomes interactive and, uh, and, and how stable it is as it loads. And what's amazing about Google Core Web Vitals and what to me has changed the game is that Google Core Web Vitals is now an SEO ranking factor. So back in the old days, if you wanted more customers, you had to buy ads. A better web experience was really only once people were already on your site. But now with Google Core Web Vitals, you can actually reduce your ad spend if you improve your Google Core Web Vitals because that will get you a better search engine ranking. You can leapfrog your competition and, uh, and that will get you to those downstream metrics, the conversions and all that sort of stuff. Um, the company that I work for now, Layer Zero by Limelight, helps e-commerce companies do this. Um, we've seen some pretty tremendous results. Uh, so Google Core Web Vitals is a leading metric that I would um, nominate. Other thoughts? So I think one uh, other metric that we look at is the core product, you know, core NPS metric for a consumer. And then we try and break the overall NPS in terms of, you know, experience on the website and then experience on the post-purchase side. And then there is a three month NPS that we also conduct, which is on the NPS of the product side. So this is how we try and break our funnel. Right at the time of placing the order, there is one metric that is tracked, which is the overall experience on the website. Then at the time of receiving, there is one NPS that is tracked. 
and then three months after receiving, there is one more NPS that is done. And all these three NPS have a relation because the last one talks about the product quality. The second one, which is right after delivering, talks about the experience. First one talks about the pre-purchase experience of the consumer. So that also is, yeah. No, I think it is very comprehensively covered. I would just add, you know, uh, one important analysis, which is the cohort analysis. We have spoken about cash and conversion, but I believe the uh, the real value is that when customer comes repeatedly uh, and <clears throat> buy from you uh, with increasing wallet share, and I, I sort of you know believe that cohort analysis uh, done on you know customer. So on one hand, you have customer cohorts and segments, and then you have you know monthly cohorts to see how is the repeat purchases across these different customer cohorts. I think that gives a lot of insight about uh, what need to be improved. Very interesting perspective. Yeah. I think, uh, sorry, Yash, go ahead, please. Yeah. No, I agree, I agree, those. Oh, great, and I think, uh, you know, all of these resonated quite a bit. In fact, uh, you know, NPS, I've seen, uh, you know, companies across industries use very powerfully and think, especially when you dig deeper into the reasons for promotion and detraction, and then actually, you know, disaggregate the NPS into what are the few things that are actually creating, uh, you know, promoters and then amplify those and what are the reasons for detraction and how do we actually you know keep working on against those and those are really you know uh, the process never stops and you just keep getting better and better uh, so very powerful uh, and i think all the other uh, metrics we've spoken about the google core web vitals is uh, was definitely a new interesting learning for me as well uh, in the past few days and the fact that uh, the google algorithms have always been developing and really as uh, people in the industry, how do we keep up with not just, you know, knowing what the algorithms are, but also, you know, our winning strategy with uh, in those algorithms. So with that, uh, you know, perhaps the, it's a neat segue into the next question, uh, you know, maybe to you, Ishendra, but, you know, again, happy to get views on how, uh, therefore, do you think the quality of mobile or web experience plays a role in driving traffic, right? Uh, once, the traf uh, once the user is on the portal, uh, we've spoken about you know, conversion rates, but what's the role in driving traffic itself? Yeah, so well, the experience on mobile versus web is quite different. Whereas uh, you know, companies can use mobile uh, app as a tool to provide more personalized experience, whereas there are some of those limitations that come when it comes to the web experience side. So if a business, you know, which is a high repeat business, which is where you want to drive faster repeats, for there, providing a personalized frequent experience becomes much, much important, uh, which is where mobile app plays a very important role. Someone like grocery, someone like fashion, uh, et cetera. Whereas for some of the businesses like mattresses, et cetera, which is where, you know, you usually make once in a year or twice in a year purchase over there you can you know sort of think of having a very seamless web experience so the way we look at both the experiences web experience is good to start with because there is a limited investment that you have to do you can start with a proper shopify application you know with the shopify website set up your product and see the quality of the product but when you want to get into more personalized experience which is where you want, want to build your loyalty program, your memberships, your rewards, personalized experience. That is where mobile app will, plays a very critical role because there are certain restrictions that a web, uh, you know, website has, which is where mobile plays a very, very important role. Also one more area where, you know, mobile helps compared to web is in retargeting because when you have a website, you know, the only channels that are available for you for retargeting is your SMS, email, uh, WhatsApp, uh, you know, or your Facebook, Google retargeting. And some of these may not be able to reach your entire repeat customer base, but with the mobile application notification, you can be a lot more creative and then you can reach to a larger repeat audience as well. So, you know, the way I would segregate is web mobile is a more personalized experience, requires a bit of uh, investment in terms of creating the stack but you can do a lot of innovation in terms of your uh, you know, notifications, et cetera, 
whereas web is slightly a general experience which is more around the product itself very interesting perspective ishanda because i uh, very distinctly remember a time when mobile was seen as a limiting medium right uh, you have limited real estate you can't communicate much you have to be very choiceful about you know the uh, load times and the size of images and data uh, you know used to be uh, at a premium but you know it's very refreshing to hear from you that actually mobile is a medium that actually creates uh, you know perhaps an advantage for you to be able to personalize and retarget uh, benefits that a web uh, you know experience does not provide uh so thanks for sharing that but look we'd love to get more views from the panel i think great thought uh, so apart from that even for the website right so in today's age even 90% of the traffic website traffic is on the mobile device right so it is very important to have a great mobile experience website uh, which is not only a responsive version of the desktop but you can have a probably a different experience on the mobile device to have a better user experience would you go uh, uh, jasmine all the way to say that mobile experience optimize that first or yeah yeah so if you see uh, so if, if i talk about sugar so if you see a sugar mobile website it is exactly the same replica of its mobile app while we have a different desktop version so that's how we look at it. Uh, yeah, uh, so I'll also say uh, there was a question about uh, Google Core Web Vitals and who can help. Uh, go to layerzero.co uh, and you'll be able to find some, some, some help with that. Um, yeah, and I'll also say, uh, you know, as far as uh, the, um, you know, the situation, the, this question at hand about getting traffic through better uh, web experience, you know, we've seen lots of companies that have you know using the technology that's now available have been able to drive better uh, better web experiences, um, better conversion rates, better traffic, better revenue. Um, again, if you go back to that same site, layerzero.co, and just pull down resources and hit customers, you can read case studies. Yes, perhaps uh, you know a follow-on question, and I think something that's you know top of mind for I'm sure all of you, but you know also a lot of the audience. uh customer acquisition cost mm -hmm. you know it's a uh, it, it's top of mind for everyone and you know uh we spoke about a lot of a lot of the metrics but if this was one metric and we were to track how this metric has trended in the last 10 years yeah you know the year on year growth is quite impressive <laughs> we would like <laughs> to see that growth in our businesses <laughs> so with that you know uh you know it's not only uh, you know starting a business is never easy but this is the new challenge for a new uh, a business where while the internet is is you know democratic provides equal opportunities to everyone it's now quite expensive mm. to uh, scale up a business especially from an acquisition standpoint how do you think about uh, in that context you know uh, we spoke about driving traffic but yep. is there a different lens one can apply to you know uh, customer acquisition uh, lower ad spend and rerouting that money to uh, potentially other areas that might help you get better uh, customer acquisition so yeah. optimization seo or anywhere yep. else you might yep. want to go so um, i think uh, seo is probably one of the most uh, uh, most uh, the best tool which gives you the most return i think everybody would agree with us on that that you know over time the compound effect of seo really comes through and uh, uh that's probably the best customer acquisition cost you're going to get but in terms of facebook i think you know we are in a age where there's not even much targeting that you can do you, it's really all about how good your creative is these days so for us at least in our experience uh, at least in the last year the only sort of optimization we can do on facebook is changing creatives testing creatives and testing out different levels of budget to see what is more profitable not what gives you the most uh, sales because uh, you can keep throwing money at it i don't think it's going to make a difference the second most important thing is not about optimizing your ads but optimizing your website your experience the more you tweak on those numbers the more you try to incrementally improve your abandon rate your checkout abandon rate your view product to add to product rate the more you try to improve your click through rate for your ads 
that's when really you're going to start optimizing your Facebook ads by optimizing your website. And another really good way I feel to improve your customer acquisition costs is to not worry about customer acquisition costs and start worrying about how to increase your average order value. Because the minute you start figuring out how to successfully do that, your customer acquisition cost is going to become a smaller share of your um, of your uh, invoice value. Another thing that I feel now it is more important than ever before, email is dead, at least for our target age group, uh, between like 16 to 30. Nobody checks their emails, especially the promotion staff. So with WhatsApp in play now, building a customer list and being active with them and segmenting, segmenting those customer lists into different WhatsApp groups and you know giving them messages and uh, promotions in the right intervals is really one of the most effective ways to get uh, sales right now. Uh, WhatsApp is so cheap. It's so easy to do that. I think that's really, uh, we, we're seeing a change in landscape where it's more important for D2C businesses to own their customer list, their WhatsApp groups, their emails, and that's what drives sales. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, yes, thank you. I think the, uh, what, uh, you know, email is dead is perhaps the, you know, uh, uh, tagline <laughs> for, the next, for the next session uh, and fully resonates. Uh, yeah. And I think the, other point that resonated is that, you know, you have to own your customer, right? And the yeah. touch points with, the, with your customer, yeah. uh, you can't let outsource that to someone else. And how do you actually yeah. manage your customers, engage with them too often, and they will ignore you, engage with them very rarely, they won't remember you. So what's yeah. the right balance of frequency and your method of engaging with them? Yeah. Uh, I, I think the larger, if I zoom out, the larger takeaway is that, you know, once acquired, a customer is very valuable, right? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, therefore extracting more value from repeats and getting them to buy more buy again is actually way more valuable than finding the next customer who will yeah. transact with you. Yeah, I agree. We, we need to spend less time trying to make our ads work and worry about more of the fundamental things. And I think everything else just follows. Uh, absolutely resonates. Anyone else uh, on this particular question of customer acquisition cost? You know, burning question everywhere right now. <laughs> I would just reiterate, you know, two things which Yash and you already covered. Focus on fundamentals and look at CAC to LTV and not just CAC in isolation. I think I would just repeat that. Yeah, and I'll Makes just sense. say again, you know, we brought up Google Core Web Vitals, but uh, it's very, very relevant here in terms of customer acquisition cost. Uh, again, you know, it's it's almost strange to think of website speed as being a factor in customer acquisition cost, but it actually is now. Um, so improve your Google Core Web Vitals and you'll reduce your customer acquisition cost. Thanks, Charlie. And Pocket, since you went last, I'll, uh, you know, take the liberty of asking the next question to you. Uh, you know, especially because given the organization and the business that you work in, you know, uh, you've been uh, in the space for uh, for several years, and you know, you're a part of the large organization that's actually doing a lot of different things uh, in the space as well. Uh, so, therefore, uh, the question is around the development team and the capability of the development team. We all uh, perhaps know how critical it is to not just have the right tech stack, the right technology backbone, but also the right team uh, and the capability in that team. The question to you, Pankaj, is building on top of that. So how do we ensure a better development experience for, uh, for the team? And how can that lead to an enhanced e-commerce experience on, our, uh, on the mobile or the website? How do we equip the team with the best tools available and drive their focus on the most value-added activities that impact experience. Uh, you know, and I, you know, I wouldn't want to elaborate more on the question, but we all know that teams can get lost in, you know, fixing the basics, the fundamentals, uh, you know, or, or spend their time on things that are actually not driving experience, but you know, uh, perhaps some other objectives. So, sure. any thoughts on this would uh, would be great to have. I think you know. Uh, before tool, I would like to sort of speak about a couple of uh, software softer aspects. You know, one is that 
connecting the developers with the business as much as possible right i think that not only motivates them and tell them the impact of the work they are doing because i think most of the developers engineers the biggest satisfaction is when you see people using the things that you have built and understanding right so for example one of the thing when i joined lanskart i started was that every engineer who is joining as a part of onboarding program they would have to visit uh, at least two stores and uh, the <clears throat> team which is joining in our uh, corporate office where our warehouse and manufacturing was have to visit that as well and then similarly the supply chain management team has to some some members of the team have to visit the warehouse before designing the new major feature and after launch of major feature uh, feature and same apply to the uh, to the uh, point of sales team as well visiting the store so that brings a lot more better perspective right because what are the the thing you are building depends on what is the con context who are the users of that product you are building and and it also enhance the engagement of the so i think that's one element uh second i would also say that you know a lot of time as a engineer we think of uh, the people think of features right that this is what business has told and i think in calculating and uh building this environment where people are not only allowed but they are encouraged to ask question that why i am asked to build this no matter you know whether it is a cto or a ceo asking you know i encourage this that you know ask what is the use why this and and share your thoughts so those are on the software uh, elements and then i think coming to the tools nowadays you know with cloud and building cloud native i think a lot of things has become easy where uh, you are using not only infrastructure but also platform and other services whether it is messaging or it is a <coughs> it's a ml toolkit like tensorflow so i think you know educating and connecting with your cloud provider so that your developers understand uh these off the shelf software components which are available right and we are not reinventing the wheel then with whole containerization and these technologies again you know making things easier for to uh, you know not doing the some of the basic boilerplate work uh, right and uh, again automation frameworks the other element i sort of believe is that once the product market fit is achieved Uh, you know doing the architecture building it in a scalable fashion so that later on when you are seeing growth you don't have to invest a lot of time in uh, repaying your tech debt and sort of you know spending a lot of time on production issues and uh, because this is i have seen again on some of the fast growing company where a lot of bandwidth goes into that and you have to then do a surgical intervention to get things in line so i think those are some of the learnings i would sort of you know highlight uh, to address this question interesting i've seen we, we've seen a lot of the same things and you know uh one of the concerns actually is you know the all of these uh cloud services that people are now using to build websites uh piecing them together is become harder and harder for developers you know we hear a lot of uh challenges that ctos and you know people who are building websites have uh just just gluing things together and keeping them stuck together um and you know another challenge that 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 we've heard honestly is you know uh, the the these are hard skills to develop you know the developers who know how to do this become more valued in the marketplace and you know we've heard complaints about e-commerce companies that uh you know they they do the hard work of getting better at building their website uh and training these developers and then somebody comes and hires the developers away and they're back you know those skills go away so um you know in fact the, the one of the things that layer 0 does is is kind of streamline that whole thing uh for example it can take at least 20 web services to build a modern website um you know aws services or google or, or microsoft azure or whatever services you use and uh you know layer 0 kind of puts all that together into one platform uh it's uh it actually builds edge services right in lets people build edge services like cdn uh and edge compute and serverless just right into the application so it kind of streamlines all of those steps 
Um, so yeah, there's a there's a lot of challenges in building a website, and, and in ways it's getting it's getting more challenging, not less challenging. Thank you, uh, Pankaj, Charlie. I think the uh, just like email is dead, I think the other one is, you know, let's not spend time repaying the tech debt. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, the entire thing about, you know, there is enough complexity now to uh, in trying to, you know, take away the complexity. So using 20 services to actually, uh, all those services exist to make life easier, but there is always, uh, you know, a better and a better tool. So how do you keep up to date? So uh, quite, quite a challenge. Uh, with that, maybe I'll transition to a burning topic, which is not always top of mind from an urgency standpoint, but I, at least in my uh, priority list, top of the list in, uh, from an importance perspective, which is cybersecurity. You know, one, uh, uh, one incident can actually take a business away, uh, uh, you know, and that's really uh, how critical it is. So perhaps, Jasmine, to start with, I'll ask this question to you. Uh, you know, cybersecurity uh, and the number of incidents of hacking or frauds have actually increased in step with the growth of e-commerce, if not faster. With that uh, background, how do you think about, one, the importance of cybersecurity in protecting your business growth? Uh, and really, you know, any thoughts or ideas you uh, would have on how to progress on this? So you rightly said, right? It, it can make or break your company, right? So imagine a news uh, saying this many users is compromised from your company, right? It can break uh, the customer trust and the customer will be scared to put their information on, on your website and app, right? So it is very important. And generally the company uh, do one mistake is like they tend to think we are too small to get into this thing, right? So cyber security, we are too small. We, we should not worry about the cyber security right now. And generally, if you see the trend, the hackers, they target the smaller companies the most, right? So it is very important to focus uh, from the beginning uh, on the security. And there are like basic checks and balance, right? So on the server side, what are the firewalls? what are the necessary access or, or, or the restrictions you put in and uh, and so is your APIs uh, are restricted the authorization is restricted um, and this can be a loss of data and eventually a loss of revenue right so it is very important uh, and you should have a cyber security analysis done on your website and app uh, to avoid any kind of uh, vulnerability, right? So it is very important and it should be focused from the beginning instead of uh, having a less focus. Makes a lot of sense, Jasper. I think the, uh, the catchphrase for me uh, was we are, we are too small, so we're never too small, right? Uh, to talk yeah. about and take steps on cyber security. It's really something that you start with rather than come to uh, at, you know, at a later stage. Yeah, I saw a statistic that said that 39% of breaches start with a web application. Um, so, you know, there's three basic types of security for a web application. So one of them is web application firewall, so often called WAF, and WAF just protects your web application from people trying to get in. Uh, the second is DDoS attacks. So DDoS is a distributed denial of service attack, I believe. And that's a, you know, that's a type of attack that people try to design to attack a website. And the key to that is being behind a large defense surface, like a large CDN, uh, like Limelights. And then the third is bots. You know, so there's good bots and there's bad bots. So if you have a bot security tool, you can block the bad bots and protect and, and, and you know, pass the good bots. Good bots like search engines, for example. How does one develop these, Charlie? Uh, they do sound quite interesting, but... Yeah, so, well, um, you know, there's... Uh, the, the easiest way is to just go to a, a service like ours, like Layer Zeros, that, that builds it in. Um, you know, we've got a kind of a seat belts included type of a philosophy. You know, you go buy a car, uh, you just have the seat belts included to protect you, the airbags included to protect you. Um, and so it's, it's same deal here. Uh, if you... You know, if you're working with a company with, with layer zero, uh, the security suite is just 
already built in and you know easy to access. It's just from the same consoles and tools that you use to access everything else. That's very interesting. So essentially, you know, pretty much go turnkey on security as well. Focus on the product and the experience, but make sure that this uh, the aspect of security is covered, and you don't need to develop the security methods yourself, right? Uh, that's the that's the big takeaway. Don't ignore it, but go to the experts. Uh, it's great advice. Any other thoughts on cybersecurity? Else, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. So I think one thing, you know, uh, as Charlie mentioned, and you sort of, you know, reiterated that that you know, for some of these protection like WAF or bot attack, you know, don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, having said that, there is also security, you know, like data security and security in your code, and you need to be careful about. I think that's where the uh, the whole idea of baking it in the beginning uh, or shift left that you know don't do it after all the development and testing is done but shift left and do it right from your design and development is another important element uh, beyond you know these tools yeah i also think it's very important to uh, secure your instagram and youtube now more than ever so a lot of a lot of these security issues more than more than the website like you know uh, a bunch of our staff like everyone keeps on getting emails of fake Instagram click here, something has been compromised YouTube. I think that happens more than ever now. Income, like it really makes or breaks the e-commerce brand these days. That's a great point. So it's not just the, you know, uh, hacking attacks, but, yeah. you know, friends and family and employees, <laughs> you know, yeah, well, yeah disproportionate access yeah so uh, they, they they're getting random emails sent to them not everybody knows to check xyz so you have to train everybody in your in your office especially the people with the access to not click on such things very basic stuff yeah. or put to yeah. fa for your instagram and youtube google analytics ads just simple things yeah yeah, that, that's a good one. Yes, I mean, don't forget the basics because yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, very often those are the ones that get skipped. Yeah. Great. Uh, and perhaps you know now to uh, the last question I had on my uh, in my list. After which I'll go to some questions that the audience has sent across. But before I get to the audience questions, just some I would love to get views from this panel on what are the future trends that you know, uh, the audience should be mindful of when we think about, uh, you know, the evolution of e-commerce in the next few years. Pankaj, perhaps we could start with you, but would love to hear inputs and views from everyone on this. Sure. So, you know, I, you know, you can debate whether it's a future trend or not, but I believe that one of the biggest thing would be the converged commerce, right? And I, I see it moving from early adoption to the mass adoption phase over period of next few years. Uh, I still see that, you know, uh, the omni-channel or converged commerce experience is still is fragmented rather than being truly converged and seamless. Uh, so that I see as a big trend. And when pandemic hit the brick and mortar, everyone has to go, uh, you know, the digital route. And now when the restrictions are easing out, uh, some of the early trends are indicating that there is a lot of heavy traffic in brick and mortar store eating on the, especially in our category, eating on the, uh, the e-commerce pie, right? Because after two years, people are suddenly out. It's not just about buying, especially if you move out from essential categories like groceries. And I think that that's where, again, the whole converged commerce is going to become uh, very critical. And I think the next wave in the converged commerce would not be that treat every channel as same. While providing a connected experience also complement them right like uh, so that i believe is a big big thing then i see the live commerce and social commerce can be another big thing uh, right because what we miss in the digital world is that human connection and conversation that you have with uh, sales executive and advice and i think that's another big trend and on the social side you know we are already seeing pinterest and instagram and, and, and the e-commerce having their, their presence and stores on, on the social side. So that again, would be a very interesting trend to look forward to. Third, I would say is the whole sustainability thing. And as we see the, the generations which are coming are very, 
very aware of these things and in fact in their decision making this is increasingly becoming a important factor about sustainability or uh, or carbon footprint environmental ecological uh, uh, safety of <coughs> things so it it's a, about the products that you are selling it is about the delivery methods you know like using electric vehicles or drones as well as packaging right like it encompasses across so i think that would be another uh, sustainable or green commerce would be another important thing to look look forward to uh, again air vr is moving from early to mass adoption uh, but i think uh, we have to still see you know how it pans out uh, the virtual currency we have seen wallet credit card and now you we would see virtual currency as a payment option and then even non fungible tokens uh, would be interesting thing to look uh, look into that how this is being used on some of the payments and owning the digital assets and if we combine all these three i think it uh point us to an important trend to look forward to which probably is hard to predict now we have early science is this whole metaverse uh, which is going to be another area where you are going to bring the physical and digital products and experiences and provide better uh, converged experiences into this and this potentially is something like you know what we used to think about internet in 1980s uh, is what is sort of metaverse probably today so it is hard to predict but it's an interesting evolution to look after and uh, this potentially can provide a very rich immersive experience connecting physical and digital as well as taking personalization to next level you know like hyper personalization so i would say these are some of the trends that i would uh, sort of very eagerly would be looking forward to i think uh, just to add to what pankaj was saying about uh, you know converging everything i think i really agree with this brick and mortar point where more and more people are going offline and i think that that is kind of created an, and with covid i've been seeing a lot of pop ups all around india coming up for 3 3 months and these are mostly d2c brands who are setting up pop ups all around india and some like lenskart is doing the endless aisle model but you know uh, they they're still fulfilling everything from from their one center but still having retail stores i think this combination of pop ups and the endless aisle and brick and mortar is really going to bloom in india where the d2c brands who have kind of enjoyed this wave of growth in the last 5 years will take that step in soon and go offline maybe in a smaller scale in short bursts everywhere but I really think it's going to become a very upcoming trend in the next two to three years. Uh, yeah, I'll throw out the headless uh, headless architectures. Yeah. So um, you know, there's two basic parts of a website. There's the back end, well, which is all the processing that happens behind the scenes, and then there's the front end, which is what the users see. Um, right now, 85% of websites are built using a you know a monolithic environment where back end and front end are together. but the 15% are already headless and that's only going to continue to grow a headless basically means that the front end environment is separate from the back end and that allows people to develop and build much faster uh it supports potentially um faster website performance for the user um uh, and there's a lot of other benefits to headless so um you know it i see that as a trend that's growing uh layer 0 supports there are There are a number of frameworks. You know, you may have heard of React and Next.js and Nuxt.js and Angular and Gatsby and all these things. These are all headless frameworks, and uh, Layer Zero supports forty-five or so headless frameworks right now. That's a growing trend. So I, I agree with uh, you know Pankaj and Yash as they said. You know, the omni-channel experience is sort of a very big trend now because. uh you know what people are expecting is that the brands with which they were buying online if it is present offline they actually go and step into those stores to just get the experience of the product or the experience of the brand at an overall level and that is one very large experience, you know area which is growing in fact there is a lot of scope of improvement in that because it, you know if you look at the tools uh, which are available which integrates online and offline you know there is a large amount of work that has to happen in that area 
and there's a very limited work that has happened there a tool which can you know come together bring omni channel experiences and once that also sort of matures that you know will sort of help a lot brands in going towards the omni channel but definitely omni channel is a very large area and a potential area where you, you know we can expect a lot of startups coming in building tools for the companies which are you know large brands which are going omni channel makes a lot of sense i think uh, a lot of this resonates right ultimately we are all humans and there is a certain uh, you know all the fantastic experience that one gets uh, online uh, whether it's mobile or website complement that with certain touch points which are physical and then just you know it amplifies the impact that your product or service or proposition can provide to the uh, consumer and really you know all the uh, uh, everything that pankaj you spoke about whether it's ar vr live commerce social commerce i mean if i uh, abstract it it's really as much more human and real life uh, that you can get you know the uh, the richer and more uh, longer lasting the, uh, will be the experience uh, and of course you know i am keenly looking out for how what happens to you know nfts metaverse uh, virtual currency uh, you know personal opinion i think all of these in some shape or form will actually be instrumental uh, and shaping how uh, you know uh, many of our customers are engaging if not with us then with others so uh, that's definitely uh, going to be a case so thank you very interesting uh, answers with that there are a couple of questions that uh, users have sent across and i will uh, ask them uh, charlie starting with you there is a question uh, and we were talking about future trends there's a question on blockchain uh, hmm. how can blockchain help in e-commerce uh, Any- okay uh, so i'll tell you my thoughts on it um blockchain so first of all blockchain is a technology about uh, trust and so we think of cryptocurrency as a the most popular use of blockchain um and those cryptocurrencies uh, use massive compute difficulty to make it impossible to crack and that's how trust is built um so certainly you know financial transactions by a cryptocurrency are one use of blockchain but if you if there are other ways to like for example if you have a trusted entity behind a blockchain the it do, it does not require a room full of servers to process the transaction and it becomes much less compute expensive so there are way that, so companies may choose to employ blockchain where they become the trusted entity entity or they use a bank or someone like that to be the trusted entity and that can make the um transaction cost much a uh, lower friction but honestly i can't wait to see what happens with blockchain i don't know what other folks might thought other folks might have about blockchain you know i think you, you mentioned about virtual currency i think another big area where blockchain uh, can play significant role as you mentioned it is all about trust and wherever there are distributed uh, autonomous entities and what blockchain can play a role i think supply chain and whole distribution and logistics there is another big area where logistics blockchain can play a very significant role you know like as it is called as from farm to table you know dining table tracing uh, you know where the raw material or what we are calling in fashion and lifestyle is from yarn to you know final garment right so i think it can play a very significant uh, role and bring a lot of new other capabilities and experiences uh, as far as trust and tracing is concerned uh, to the consumers great another technology that i <laughs> i am keen to learn more about uh and actually be an operator in some uh other lifetime uh so the second question uh from the uh from the viewers and that's not pointed at any individual as such so i'll leave it open to the floor uh and the question goes as such we are in e-commerce in home decor indoor gardening products fragrance candles uh it's almost 6 months to launch our website what will be the most effective way to get more leads to our website currently we do social media marketing campaigns but conversion is not so good can you highlight on influencer marketing uh and will it what do you think uh will it be helpful you know at a start directly relying on facebook google for results sort of becomes slightly challenging because uh you know 
no one knows about the brand uh, and then you can only target people who actually like the, you, who are of similar interest as of the product which is a you know which is quite a you know limited set and then there are other brands which are competing so uh, you know one thing which really helps uh, you know at a start to build a brand is one is influencer marketing and second is leveraging some of the partnerships portal uh, which is where you can go on a slightly you know for a start only not at the end but you know you can go for a slightly discounting route uh, and tie up with partnerships so that people experience your product know about your brand and then slowly and steadily build on performance marketing as and when your brand awareness keeps on increasing so uh, partnerships and uh, uh, influencer marketing play a very important role the reason why influencer marketing also plays a very important role is because a lot of these micro influencers you know are quite popular in their own geographies and uh, you know once they start uh, talking about the brand or once they start telling about the brand you start getting people who have a similar interest of the brand and then your facebook google sort of automatically keeps on identifying the interest groups that are relevant to your product uh, so which is where you know these become your small brand ambassadors a very effective source of getting you know uh, brand ambassadors uh, to identify the like look, look at, you know audiences for your facebook google so you know i think these are the two channels which help facebook google identifying the right uh, audiences for you thanks sir it's very uh, very helpful uh, gentlemen we are uh, on time we have 2 minutes left but uh, i do want to make sure i thank you first uh, you know so yash ishendra pankaj jasmin uh, charlie uh, it's been a fantastic conversation i have definitely learned a few new things uh, and you know uh, several other beliefs have gotten reinforced uh, i think you know starting with the point about uh, customer experience it's you know no user will come back if that's a negative experience you know that was a very powerful statement to start our conversation uh, and the fact that user experience straddles all touch points whether digital or physical uh, we spoke about metrics how conversion rates and then all the underlying metrics whether leading lagging intermediate you know are really going towards uh, you know conversions uh, and the fact that google core web vitals you know it's a new set of metrics and really you know it's now uh, driving through commercial outcomes uh, not just you know experience outcomes uh, and you know is actually also perhaps helping in uh, you know acquisition uh, a refreshing thought on mobile is actually an advantage uh, you know compared to a disadvantage a disadvantage which was a belief perhaps 10 years back helps us personalize retarget uh, you know but uh, as pankaj very eloquently uh, you know also uh, mentioned later the tech stack has to be built uh, you know keeping the future in mind so that we are not spending our lives repaying the tech debt so how do you actually build that uh, into our plans uh, we heard about seo uh, providing the uh, best returns and to that yes i think a phrase that i will remember if for a while email is dead uh you know uh, a customer once acquired just is much way more valuable than a new customer fishing for a new customer so finding the right mediums right intervals and definitely not email uh is uh you know is absolutely critical uh pankaj your point about connecting developers with the business uh being very critical but the fact that you know there have a lot of tools but can we actually simplify life for them uh you know using an integrated tool charlie i think like you mentioned uh would be super powerful uh and finally i think that we talked about uh you know before the trends which was a very interesting conversation uh you know cyber security i think jasmine the point that you made uh we are too small to invest or think about cyber security that's absolutely the wrong mindset you know it is a day one or a day zero activity and you know it's not about reinventing the tool it's just about tapping into the right uh tools that already exist it's turnkey and yes the point that you made about simple things uh you know think about the simple and the complex things on cyber security and finally i think we had a very very interesting uh you know set of comments and uh, inputs from you on converge commerce live commerce social commerce sustainability which is a trend uh you know across industries uh you know and, and lots of different interpretations of sustainability uh and lots of new things coming across on virtual currency nfts metaverse but really i think the one thing that came across 
quite powerfully to me is that how are we making our, all our businesses more relatable, more human, and engaging with the customer across touch points in a way that's most naturally, uh, you know, coming to us humans. Years of evolution, uh, we have to tap into that and not expect, you know, uh, our brains and our ways of interacting with each other to evolve uh, in a few years. But thank you, everyone. Fantastic discussion. Uh, I know we've exceeded uh, by a minute or two. Have a great day and uh, hope our viewers enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Thank you, Ravi. Good, Ravi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.